uh, Jeff Prisida. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Joshua Hare. I'm the Lewis Lemberg Professor of Medicine. Nope. We can hear you, Josh. Okay. Uh, good, good afternoon. Um, I'm Joshua Hare, the uh, Lewis, Lemberg, per, per, Lewis Lemberg Professor of Medicine. It's my great uh, privilege to introduce the 31st Miriam Lemberg Lectureship. Um, we have, uh, I would just like to relate the story uh, each year of how the professorship and the lectureship came about. Um, uh, Dr. Lewis Lemberg, who was a real uh, pioneer in cardiology in the city of Miami, going back to 1948 when, when he moved here, he held numerous leadership roles in cardiology at uh, Jackson, UM, and other um, programs around the city. Um, when Miriam, Miriam decided to uh, endow a professorship in his name, which um, I'm honored to hold, uh, she presumably was doing this behind his back at the same time that behind her back, he was endowing this uh, lectureship, which has been a, a wonderful program for us in the Department of Medicine and the Division of Cardiology for the past uh, 31 years. So we're, uh, it's uh, great to have everybody here. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Dr. Ubu, the chief resident, who will introduce our speaker. All right. And so good afternoon, everyone. We have the honor and pleasure of introducing Dr. Eldrin um, Foster Lewis, and he's joining us from Stanford University, where he is the Simon H. Sturzer Professor of Medicine and the Chief of Cardiovascular Division at Stanford. And so he continues to practice clinically as a heart failure uh, clinician who has completed significant work and in integrating quality of life into the clinical practice of patients with advanced heart failure. And so he completed just a little bit about Dr. Lewis. He completed his undergrad at Penn State um, Medical School at University of Pennsylvania, and then went on to complete internal medicine residency, cardiovascular disease fellowship, and advanced heart failure fellowship um, at the Brigham Women and Children's Hospital in Boston. Along the way, he also completed his MPH at the Harvard School of Public Health and Clinical Effectiveness. He served on faculty at the Harvard Medical School for almost 20 years, from 2002 till 2020, where he served as a mentor for faculty, house staff, students, the course director for the cardiovascular clerkship, and an advocate for diversity and equity through service on the School of Medicine Admissions Committee, the Diversity Subcommittee for Internal Medicine, the Diversity Oversight Committee, and the Department of Medicine's Health Equity um, Committee, which he was co-chair, all prior to taking his current role at Stanford. He is nationally renowned and has served as the chair of a uh, American Heart Association and on the, and the editorial board of Circulation Magazine. He has received numerous local, national, and international recognition for presentations and is well known as an expert in the field. He has been the recipient of numerous NIH grants, has over 150 publications, of which greater than 18 are first author publications, and has co-authored numerous clinical guidelines. Um, he's received numerous awards at every stage of his career, um, including most recently having the heart failure service named after him at the Brigham um, in 2020, and receiving an award from the Association of Clinical Cardiologists. He's a part of the Association of Black Cardiologists and is a tour de force in the field. Please extend a warm welcome to Dr. Lewis, who will be talking to us today about transforming the care of patients with heart failure, the role of health equity, innovation, and patient-centered outcomes. Welcome, Dr. Lewis. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, also I'd like to thank Dr. Weiss and thank Dr. Hare as well as uh, thank you uh, to the Lindbergh family. Um, and, and really thanks to all of you for the opportunity to have uh, a chance to talk with you about uh, transforming the care of uh, equity and, um, and patients um, with heart failure. Uh, 
Uh, these are my disclosures. I don't think it'll have a big impact on the, the content of this lecture. Um, so there'll be three kind of objectives that I'll hope to cover. The first is to discuss strategies to improve outcomes in heart failure, including prevention, treatment, and health equity. Then to understand the role of quality of life as an outcome in patients with heart failure and as, a, as an anchor for medical decision-making. And then finally, to describe future strategies for managing patients, both in clinical trials and practice. So there are about 6.2 million people living with heart failure in the United States. And over the last 30 years, 30 plus years, since 1986, uh, when DHEFT-1 was originally published, uh, the first study basically showing improved outcomes with uh, hydralazine nitrates, there's been a steady progress uh, in the reduction of mortality in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction to the point that by the time you had the combination of ARNIs, uh, beta blockers, and MRAs, uh, which I'll go over some of that data, you had about a, almost a 60% a, a uh, risk reduction in, mor in mortality in these patients. Uh, therefore, the focus of research has really been to kind of shift a little bit to both quality and quantity of life. Uh, how do we get people to live better? Um, HEF-PEF management, uh, the management strategies to optimize care, interventions, precision medicine, and also devices. But despite the significant progress that we've seen, the residual mortality rate remains quite high. Uh, so as you can see in the five-year outcomes of elderly patients who are uh, hospitalized with heart failure, uh, you still see a mortality rate that is uh, greater than most cancers. Um, so we still have a long way to go. If you look at five years after discharge, about 75% of patients have died, and you have a 95% mortality or readmission for heart failure. And you actually see this regardless of whether or not it's HEF-REF, uh, HEF uh, mid-ranged, or HEF-preserved. And in, especially in patients who are self-described Black, we see that there's a more aggressive natural history with earlier age of onset, more LV hypertrophy, and more advanced disease at the time of diagnosis. There's different etiology where you see more non-ischemic instead of ischemic disease, a lot of uh, concomitant hypertension, diabetes, and obesity, as well as a variety of endothelial dysfunction uh, and increased oxidative stress. And of course, uh, TTR amyloid is uh, more common as well. But also there's a worse prognosis with a higher rate of hospitalization, um, and you have genetic polymorphisms that may influence uh, the response to therapies, not to mention the um, confounding um, social determinants of health that can influence access to care. So if you uh, look at uh, the current management of heart failure, there are kind of four pillars of heart failure management. That includes ACE, ARB, or ARNI. Um, then you have the beta blockers, menocorticoid receptor antagonists, and most recently the SGLT2 inhibitors, which I'll talk about. And in fact, um, as you manage patients, the goal is to get patients on all four as quickly as possible, but you do have to start low and go slow. Um, if you kind of start at target doses, uh, then patients will have the fallacy of this non-tolerance of these medications. So you have to start slow and whether or not you um, start the beta blocker versus the ACE inhibitor uh, or start the uh, SGLT2 inhibitor, has been a subject for debate, but ultimately you wanna get them on all four, preferably within the first four weeks, and then you can up titrate. And there are some strategies that one can use. But once you've done that, you certainly can look at certain populations. So for instance, patients who are persistently symptomatic and so they're self-described uh, black patients, um, you may be able to use hydralazine nitrates because of the AHEF study. Um, for patients who um, have residual um, reduced ejection fraction despite GDMT, considering ICDs plus or minus CRT uh, or cardiac resynchronization therapy. And then also you want to consider additional therapies, which we'll talk about as well, including transplant and mechanical circulatory support device. So when you look at the uh, angiotensin neprilysin inhibitor or ARNI, um, in general, these, pay, these uh, therapies uh, work quite well um, by uh, the neprilysin uh, uh, reduces systemic vascular resistance, sympathetic tone, aldosterone, cardiac fibrosis, and ventricular hypertrophy. And it also increases naturesis, which can uh, lead to improved outcomes. Um, but you, know, you also have the renin angiotensin system, which actually can um, increase a lot of these things and decrease naturesis. So if you're blocking the renin angiotensin system um, and you block um, 
the nepro and you basically inhibit um, the uh, neprilysin um, uh, so that you can actually have a, a um, um, have um, endogenous um, uh, 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 BNP. Uh, then these patients can actually do uh, quite well. Uh, you can't use an ACE inhibitor with the uh, neprilysin inhibition because of the uh, increase in the bradykinin, which can lead to, uh, to angioedema. So uh, the sucubitril valsartan was initially tested in the Paradigm HF study, 8,400 uh, patients um, uh, comparing sucubitril valsartan to enalapril, no placebo, and there's a 20% risk reduction in cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. And with this, uh, this really changed uh, the, the paradigm um, for how we manage these patients. Uh, the Pioneer HF study looked at 881 patients who were acutely admitted. Uh, and the purpose of this study was uh, for Paradigm HF, there was a run-in phase to ensure tolerability. And the question was, is it safe to start uh, an ARNI in the setting of acute decompensation? And the, the answer is yes. If you look at the change in N-terminal pro-BNP, uh, you saw a, a dramatic uh, reduction uh, for, uh, for Sucubitril Valsartan, um, and uh, that was about a 30% reduction. But if you look at rehospitalizations, you also saw a, re a reduction in the readmissions uh, for heart failure. Uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors are relatively new, but, um, but similar to the MRAs, they've been consistently showing positive results. Uh, so the SG by inhibiting SGLT2, uh, you can get a lot of uh, impacts, including a decrease in renin-angiotensin, aldosterone system, reduce oxidative stress, reduce inflammation, and also reduce uh, the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and uh, there are several studies in HEF-REF, uh, including a DAPA-HF study that uh, looked at DAPA-Gliflozin versus placebo, and there's a 25% risk reduction in heart failure hospitalizations and death. And then the EMPRA reduced um, was uh, a study that looked at empagliflozin that also showed a 25% risk reduction in the combination of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization. And uh, the outcomes were similar in those with pre-existing diabetes and those who never had a diagnosis of diabetes. So we start thinking of SGLT2 inhibitors not just as a glucose-lowering agent, but actually as a heart failure medication. Uh, and then there's a Victoria trial that looked at varisequat. Uh, so varisequat is a novel oral soluble guanylate cyclase stimulator. It enhances cyclic GMP, and it directly stimulates soluble guanylate cyclase independent of nitric oxide. Uh, so when you looked at the study uh, in Victoria, uh, verisequat versus placebo, there was a 10% risk reduction in the combination of cardiovascular death or heart failure hospitalization in patients with reduced EF, 5,000 patients with class two through four. But if you look at the impact of verisequat compared to some of the other four drugs that we use routinely, it was not consistent. And this is a reason that it's not a first-line therapy for heart failure management. So what about HEF-PEF, or heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Well, um, SGLT2 inhibitors have been studied, and I'll go over that data in a minute. Um, and uh, it shows that it can be beneficial in decreasing heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular mortality. MRAs uh, may decrease hospitalizations. We did the TopCat study, which looked at uh, spironolactone versus placebo. And if you, uh, in the total study, um, it was negative. And I will emphasize that we just missed statistical significance. But as you probably know, if you look at the Americas compared to Russia and the Republic of Georgia, there was a real difference in the overall mortality rate and heart failure hospitalization rate of the patients in Russia and Georgia that were dramatically lower uh, to the point that we think that they probably didn't have heart failure. And if you just look at the Americas post hoc analysis, um, their, the primary endpoint was met. However, even in the overall study, there was a reduction in heart failure hospitalization, even when you include um, the participants enrolled in uh, Russia and uh, in Republic of Georgia. And that is the reason that it is a 2B indication that in select patients, MRAs may decrease hospitalizations. And then finally, ARNIs may decrease hospitalizations as well, which we'll go over. Um, there's the mid, uh, mildly reduced ejection fraction. Those are patients who were often forgotten. The EFs between 41 and 49%. They have a lot of characteristics that are very similar to the patients with reduced ejection fractions, but some that are similar to the ones with HEF-PEF. But basically, SGLT2 inhibitors have been shown to be beneficial 
in hospitalizations and cardiovascular mortality, and also ARNIs, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and MRAs can be considered as well to reduce the risk of heart failure hospitalizations with 2A and 2B recommendations. So this is the data that supported these guidelines. Uh, the Paragon HF study, our, our group did this, uh, which um, looked at Valsartan versus uh, Sucubitril Valsartan, and there was um, a hazard ratio of 0.87. It missed statistical significance with the p-value of 0.06 in 4,800 patients. If you looked at uh, the total heart failure hospitalizations, you did see it. And then also, if you looked at the um, non-adjudicated site level data, it was also significant um, as well. And so based upon that, if you look at Paragon plus Paradigm across the range of ejection fraction, you can see that at the preserved ejection fractions, um, you can see a benefit. But then as the ejection fraction increased, you can see that um, you did not see the same benefit. So based upon a lot of secondary analysis and looking at this data, the FDA approved an extended indication to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and hospitalizations in heart failure, but clearly saying that if it's when the ejection fraction is below normal or below 50% based upon this data. The Emperor Preserved looked at empagliflozin in chronic and acute HEFPEF. Uh, so now it's already been shown to be beneficial in HEFREF. And now in this study, uh, had a hazard ratio of 0.79, so a 21% risk reduction in patients with HEFPEF with or without diabetes. And um, this was heart failure hospitalization or cardiovascular death. And this is now a standard of care as well. And most recently, the DELIVER trial uh, looked at dapagliflozin compared to uh, placebo and showed the same benefit with cardiovascular mortality and heart failure hospitalizations. Uh, as we talk about quality of life, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors have consistently shown a modest improvement in quality of life, and there are a lot of mechanisms that are proposed. This was a study that specifically looked at um, um, the uh, patient-reported outcomes, uh, 324 patients, uh, looked at KCCQ and six-minute walk tests, and you saw improvements in both uh, the KCCQ, as you can see, about a, a six-point uh, difference in a, in a blinded trial but the secondary endpoints showed an improvement in six-minute walk as, as well as uh, weight loss. Uh, there are specific patient populations where there have been significant improvements as well, and that includes uh, ATTR amyloid. Uh, because of uh, medicines such as uh, tefamidus, um, people are now looking uh, for TTR amyloid mainly because you have a potential intervention and the key is that the intervention has to happen early stage. So if you look at the pivotal trial for patients who were more advanced, uh, they actually did not do as well. Uh, so you really want to capture them earlier. And this is the algorithm um, where if uh, they have a presence of a monoclonal light chain, then you would uh, do a biopsy and you would look for AL amyloid. Um, but if they don't, then you can do a pyrophosphate scan. And if it's abnormal, consider TTR gene sequencing. And if they have uh, ATTR amyloid, consider genetic counseling, and consider treatment. Um, and um, these patients are at risk for, um, uh, for um, atrial standstill, so they are at risk for anticoagulation as well. And uh, regardless of Chad's vascular score, if they have AFib, they should be anticoagulated. And then finally, the Explorer HCM trial uh, looked at patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and they were randomized to mavacamptan versus placebo. This was a first-in-class cardiac myosin inhibitor and uh, showed uh, that there was an improvement in the uh, New York Heart Association class as well as the six-minute walk distance and the exercise capacity. And based upon, and you also saw an improvement in quality of life. So based upon the Explorer HCM, now people are looking at these uh, cardiac myosin inhibitors as a possible therapy for these patients that could potentially delay the time for surgical myectomy. Uh, and other um, approaches. So as we kind of think about all of the advances that we've seen, not only from 1986 to the, the mid um, 2005 or so, but really over the last uh, six years as well, we have a lot of therapies. Um, but I think as the therapies progress, we also see people are, 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 um, are actually falling behind. And so when I think of strategies to transform care in heart failure, we have to go beyond continuing to push the pharmacologic and the device-based interventions, but we need to optimize medical therapy and actually increase the time from trial to bedside. 
uh, uptake of medical therapies post trials continue. It continues to be a, a real problem uh, to the point that if you were to look at non clinical trial patients, it's amazing that for ACE inhibitors that have been around since um, 1991, uh, since VHEF2 clearly demonstrating a benefit over hydralazine and nitrates, you would see 40% of patients who really should be on an ACE and ARNI, uh, sorry, ACE or ARB, who are not on it. So these are cheap drugs. Um, they're easily affordable, and they're still, still not doing. They're still not there. Uh, the inpatient care and 30-day readmissions. We have not uh, improved uh, the 30-day outcomes, and the mortality rate post-discharge remains quite high for these patients. The management of HEFPAF continues to evolve, assessing and improving prognosis. When we see new patients with heart failure, one of the first things that I do is I try to alleviate their concerns because I know that they look at quote unquote Dr. Google and they see the, all of the morbidity and mortality associated with heart failure. And they say, am I, gonna be, am I gonna die in two years? And so trying to identify the patient who's gonna do well and have a good natural history versus someone who's gonna rapidly progress will be really important. And then improving symptoms and quality of life and advancing heart failure, as well as addressing health equity, racial differences, management of comorbid illnesses, as well as implementing virtual visits and digital health implementation. And with all of these, we have to always address cost. And then finally, uh, gene-based therapies. So the first thing that we can do is prevention. And this is something that all of us can do, not just cardiologists. In fact, 85% of heart failure patients are managed by non-cardiologists, right? Um, and so I think we have to start at primordial preventions. And that, that includes weight loss, exercise, avoidance of toxins, early identification of genetic polymorphisms, as well as dietary changes, and even coming up with better strategies for screening for heart failure. Because um, if we don't do that, then patients can progress um, uh, quite rapidly. Uh, so primordial prevention is preventing people from developing the risk factors. And then you have primary prevention, right? So you wanna control blood, blood pressure, control sugar, reduce proteinuria, protection during cancer therapies. We have increased, it's amazing, the explosion of uh, cancer therapies that can actually revolutionize the treatment of a variety of cancers but some of them, especially the checkpoint inhibitors and some of those are associated with some cardiovascular uh, risk. And so how do we protect the heart while we're actually treating for cure? And then behavioral changes are really important as well as components of primordial prevention. And then finally, secondary prevention strategies, post-MI care, time is myocardium, uh, the stage B cardiomyopathy treatment, treatment of PAD and CKD, as well as um, uh, addressing all of the other components. So there are a lot of uh, established and possible risk factors for heart failure that we all can look for. You know, we know there are some that are, you know, that are major clinical risk factors. As you can see, there are a variety of toxic uh, risk precipitants, and these are things that we need to uh, continue to try to prevent um, young people typically from starting uh, genetic risk predictors, and as well as all of the minor clinical risk predictors for heart failure. And the key is that a lot of these are reversible, and we should actually take action on a lot of these reversible risk factors. But what are the other strategies? We can uh, come up with better management for ambulatory management. And I think uh, for optimizing the heart failure patient, uh, establish the etiology is really important because there are countless numbers of etiologies of heart failure that are reversible. Uh, so the catheterization is really important for patients who have risk factors or are above a certain age, primarily because 50% of patients with heart failure have coronary disease as the etiology. Um, but you want to look for labs that can identify reversible causes um, and then uh, treat those. Uh, achieve, achieving euvolemia is key. It's amazing how many people have residual volume overload, and that's the reason they're symptomatic. And uh, they're, the problem is you can't do a right heart catheterization in everyone, but as technology evolves and we're able to have non-invasive measures of volume overload, we may be able to identify those patients. And certainly an easy way is by using something as simple as a biomarker like N-terminal pro-BNP may not be as good in patients who are obese. Uh, we want to stabilize comorbid conditions, including hypertension, COPD, kidney disease, and coronary disease, and establish DDMT. And there are a variety of strategies. The strategy that doesn't work is hope. You know, I hope that when I see them, that, uh, that they're going to get on DDMT. But uh, there are pharmacologic-led strategies that work. You can have um, app bases that can work, um, you know, using N uh, BNP algorithms to follow anything where you're just following attention, but we can't do it by seeing patients once or twice in a clinic because it's gonna take years to basically get them on all four GDMT and then we're losing an opportunity to cause reverse remodeling. We were talking earlier 
that, um, you know, when, I, when we were in training, you saw these big dilated hearts with LV sizes of eight centimeters. You don't see that anymore because of a lot of the therapies that we have, but we have to get them on those therapies. And then it's really important for restoring functional capacity as well. Um, when I first meet a patient, my first goal is to cause their LV dysfunction if they have HEFREF to reverse. And secondly, is to get them back to an asymptomatic status because then they can actually do better long-term. But this is a team effort. And this effort um, includes, I guess the slides are delayed. Uh, it, um, we have to avoid the fallacy of stability. So when patients come into clinic, we often will say you're doing great when they're class three, you know, because they're stably class three, but that's stably bad and we're losing an opportunity. Um, and uh, what we want is to identify these patients and, and it's a team effort with all of the people here playing a role in their management. I think we have to have an integrative model of care over time. And that includes um, folk with the understanding, and we've done this work, as patients are doing well and their the quality of life is good, their focus is survival for the most part. They, I wanna live as long as possible. But as their disease progresses over time, from the time of diagnosis to the time that they're unfortunately dying and progressing, then they become more symptom sensitive. And we should, we should actually align therapies with those patients. And at the, uh, we should uh, consider palliative care upstream. And there's a difference between palliative care and hospice. And I think we need to kind of rebrand that because there are a lot of things that we do that actually can accelerate worsening outcomes as the patients progress. If their creatinine is three, we can't push ACE, ARBs, and ARNIs. We have to be very careful with beta blockers. In fact, we may need to reduce beta blockers as their cardiac output goes down and as they may be chronotropically incompetent. Uh, so it's important that um, in the early stages, we have the usual care team and we're doing all of the things that we want to do to prevent disease progression, to keep them alive as long as possible, maintaining the best quality of life. And as they progress, the co-management becomes really important. And even at the end stages, I actually think there's a, a, a role for having the palliative care team co-manage with the primary team. And the reason is because some patients in studies have shown, have demonstrated that they're unlikely to say that they want um, to focus on quality because they don't want you to give up on them. And they feel that you may give up. So I think it's important to have two different teams kind of managing these patients. We have to address the, the elephant in the room, the health inequity. Uh, this was a study that we did that looked at, uh, in the premier registry, looking at patients who were admitted to the intensive care unit with heart failure. And if uh, 571 hospitals, over 100,000 patients, and basically for patients who were Black, they were much less likely uh, to, to, not, to, to, um, to not see a cardiologist. So white patients were more likely to see a cardiologist than, than Black patients. And if you um, look at this, females were more likely, uh, whether they're female or male, if you're urban or rural, it didn't matter. There was no effect modification there. And uh, we also looked at um, differences. And as you know, uh, patients who are self-described Black have worse outcomes, but that's driven more by hospitalizations. This was in TopCat. And we basically showed um, that um, there was uh, no difference in adherence to study medications, despite some people saying this is why we can't enroll a diverse patient population but there was a 51% higher risk of heart failure hospitalization despite favorable characteristics. There was a similar mortality rate and spironolactone had the same effect uh, whether you're a black or a non-black. A study that we did with, uh, with Joe Lascauzo's help uh, when I was at Brigham was actually looking at where patients got admitted at Brigham and looked at 2008 to 2017, all referred, self-referred to the emergency department and looked at whether or not they got admitted to a cardiology service versus the hospitalist service um, with uh, decompensated heart failure. And we also did multivariable modeling and uh, propensity matching. And uh, so if you look at uh, white patients versus black patients versus Latino patients, um, in general, um, uh, uh, black and Latino patients were younger. Um, you saw that um, you also um, had a, a variety of comorbid conditions that would actually, if anything, push you towards being admitted to cardiology services. However, if you look at the predictors in multivariable modeling, uh, you're 25% um, lower odds of being admitted to cardiology if you're a Black and almost a 50% lower odds if you're a Latino uh, being admitted to the cardiology service. And, um, and also, if you look at uh, other predictors, it was um, older age. Uh, so patients over the age of 75, uh, females 
as well as um, 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 a few other factors, including comorbid uh, conditions. And this didn't change regardless of the years, whether we went back to 2008 and uh, 10 when I first looked at this, but didn't publish it. And then we looked at naturally what happened over uh, the last um, additional seven years. And in fact, when we did propensity matching, uh, once again, the odds um, of being admitted to cardiology was uh, 60, it was 40% less uh, um, if you were black or Latino and about 25% less if you were female to be admitted. And uh, one of the, the, the consequences, regardless of race, ethnicity, or sex at birth, um, you basically had a 30-day readmission rate that was higher, and that was driven by the service and not driven by those characteristics. So it's really important to kind of consider uh, some of those. Now, what about affordability and access? Um, we, we know that uh, healthcare in the United States is expensive. Um, we were talking earlier whether or not $4 trillion is enough. Um, you know, if, uh, if we were the Department of Defense, it would probably be more. Um, but a lot of it comes, out, comes down to uh, whether or not you need that. But I often will talk about quality of life, and I'll talk about healthcare as well, is it's very similar to the oxygen content in the room. Right now, none of us are thinking about that. But if we couldn't breathe immediately, we would think about the air quality. And then all of a sudden that becomes important. And I think similarly, when we lose quality of life in heart failure, and when we develop a disease like heart failure, then it becomes really important. And this uh, increase is driven uh, partly by hospital care and physician services, despite what people say, uh, a lot of the pie is driven by a variety of other um, causes and it's not going down, it's not going down. And in fact, if we look at drivers of increased healthcare costs, we have the cost of medications and hospitalizations, Certainly the cost for FDA approval continues to increase is uh, almost $2 billion per increase. I think the lack of tort reform creates some of these issues as well. And the orphan drugs, which are really important for these rare conditions, but they have a longer uh, patent. And so as a consequence, the cost isn't gonna be driven down by competition. Uh, we have decentralized extended family. And I think this requires uh, more hospitalizations um, with uh, SNF and rehab. You know, we're trying to develop a, a, a home hospital, but it's hard to do that when you don't have support. Uh, so I think this limited social support is continuing and we're seeing the fragmented family kind of leading to that. Um, devices and rising prevalence of social determinants of health, but also critical care management and the imbalance between prevention and treatment here in the United States. There's not enough coverage for the prevention. Uh, and also there's a lot of care uh, spent on end of life care. And then the changing lifestyles. We're seeing increased obesity across the country, uh, diabetes as a consequence in part to that, and sedentary states. So all of this is kind of driving increased healthcare. But I think if you look at the limited uptake of GDMT in, in heart failure, um, I think one is the limited diversity um, in clinical trials. So you have people who may or may not feel comfortable taking a medicine, and then they can kind of say, well, I don't know if you tested it, they, I doubt that, uh, that lay people are reading the primary literature, but they hear, well, I hear that you didn't enroll someone who looks like me, so I'm not going to take that medicine. Uh, you have limited power for subgroup analysis, uh, but there are physician factors, including physician inertia, clinician experience, and perception of research. Uh, and then you have the patient level factors, including polypharmacy. And when we think of that, we should think of not the classes of medicine, but the number of pills that they take that can actually drive this. And the out-of-pocket cost becomes important. But third party costs, structural inequities, as well as healthcare delivery and problem that we have with that system um, all kind of drive decreased heart failure medication use. Um, and the impact of financial toxicity is real. You know, for providers, there's limited care options, discussing cost versus benefit, frustration and burnout, as well as extra administrative burdens and costs. And we have to spend time explaining the rationale. And for patients, it's a choice, balancing the choice between food and therapies and rationing follow up as well as um, putting less focus on prevention of progression. Uh, this was a study that showed um, how many people actually uh, decided to delay care or even just forget about care. And it turns out that 60% of non-elderly and 46% of elderly patients with heart failure reported deferring care due to financial barriers. A one, among the ones who decided to do that, it was $8,000 a year, greater expenditures out of pocket compared to the ones who didn't. Uh, I think the reason that the elderly patients had a lower percentage who deferred care was because of Medicare. So once again, it gets at the importance of access to care, insurance, and also the out-of-pocket cost. And if you look at predictors of uh, foregone care, 
in general, uh, the non-elderly was the biggest predictor. Um, and whether you had more comor comorbid conditions or not, it, it didn't really impact uh, the impact on uh, delayed care and heart failure. So we also should provide patient-centered care. We should really focus on improving quality of life. Um, and I think as we move forward, uh, by the way, patient-centered care is from the Institute of Medicine, Medicine now the National Academies. Um, it's a healthcare that establishes a partnership among pr practitioners and patients. And we really do need to build patient-physician relationships, focus on disabilities and patients' experience, patient participation, as well as cultural competency, expectations and personality, as well as establishing goals of care early on as opposed to the last few days of life and ad addressing language barriers. Uh, quality of life is a way of measuring uh, this. This is a, a concept that used to be really difficult to understand, but I think uh, because of work that's been done over the last few decades, it's actually starting to, to make it into mainstream. Um, and in fact, uh, we did a study uh, looking at the uh, kind of the whether or not it's feasible to assess quality of life in clinical practice. Because the, uh, the short answer would be, oh, I don't know, we don't have time for that. But in reality, that's what we do. If we sit down and talk to the patient, the first thing we ask is, how are you feeling? You know, how have things been since uh, the last visit? So these are things that I actually think an instrument can be very helpful in facilitating this. And now we've instituted this uh, as standard of care at Stanford University. In fact, we have a pro-HF trial that is ongoing led, led by Alex Sandu that's on, uh, just looking at the long-term um, reduction in heart failure hospitalizations and mortality associated with, um, with doing this in clinical practice. But doing this, one of the things that we found is that uh, only half of patients who have uh, impaired quality of life with heart failure say that heart failure is a reason. In fact, uh, a lot of patients either have other medical problems or they have non-medical problems altogether that are impacting their quality of life. So it's important that we understand what's going on with the patient. And the other thing that we found is even among patients who we uh, said were New York Heart Association class one, uh, there were 294 patients, a lot of these patients had significant limitations. And this was regardless of whether or not they were heart failure dominant versus non-dominant in terms of the cause of their quality, uh, the, the impairment in their quality of life. So once again, if we only use New York Heart Association class, we're missing an opportunity to intervene on these patients. And so the benefits in clinical practice for quality of life, certainly it allows us to define patient reported outcomes in the real world, to facilitate medical decision making, especially as they get more complex, as we increase our abilities to utilize um, non uh, or less invasive interventions for structural heart disease, such as the mitral clip, TAVR, et cetera. It defines trajectory of patients and we can screen for issues such as depression, anxiety, and some of those other issues. The limitations include the shorter instruments, the preferences for patients, especially if they're doing well, uh, time constraints in clinic, the lack of understanding of these instruments, which we're trying to overcome, the heterogeneity of the population and applicability of data. And to be honest, um, I've talked to John Spertus about this, but a big issue is the cost, because if the healthcare systems have to pay per use, that becomes a non-starter. So we need to have free uh, instruments that we can use. Uh, and if we can't use the KCCQ, we need to develop others. And then finally, we want to integrate technology and advanced genomics and, uh, uh, and cell-based therapies for the patients. Um, and this includes taking advantage. So economists basically said that um, COVID-19 and the, all of the consequences of COVID-19 uh, basically allowed us to accelerate 10 years in digital technology in the non-healthcare space. We should not, in general, we tend to lag behind other sectors. We should not do that here. So I actually think that, uh, you know, when I first started at, uh, at Stanford in March of 2020, it was literally the beginning of the pandemic. And within two weeks, I had to figure out how are we gonna see patients when uh, California was the first one to have a lockdown and, uh, and we had to kind of protect our providers. And so we went from about 2% virtual visits. And I have to say that was on my, that was one of my tasks was to increase virtual visits. That was on one of my vision statements. And uh, it allowed me to do that quickly, quickly, because we converted from about 2% to virtually 80 plus percent uh, virtual visits in a matter of a month. So it can happen. The problem is there are a lot of barriers to doing this, but what are the benefits? Well, you know, you have the healthcare systems and schools. It uh, allows us to reallocate resources, right? Instead of building a new building for seeing patients, you may be able to see a cadre of patients through virtual visits. It allows for generating revenue 
because now as you extend your network and as we extend our network and uh, throughout California, um, you don't have to build all brick and mortar, but in fact, you can actually extend all the way across your state. Of course, we have issues with across the state line, and that was uh, mitigated during the peak of COVID. Now that's rolled back. I think we have to work on that as well, because it's really unfortunate if you have a patient who is five minutes away from you and they happen to be out of the state of Florida, but they, they, um, they have to go uh, two hours to get to a, a facility that's in their state. Um, but also for patients and families, it provides access. You know, patients who are poor are the ones who can't take two hours off because they're getting paid hourly. It allows medical advice and reduce infectious exposures and reduce distress and it involves the caregiver. It's amazing when I do these virtual visits where the, the daughter or the, typically the daughter, but the daughter or the son or someone else is there and they're basically kind of correcting the patient at that time. And then for clinicians and teams, it's faster turnover. By a show of hands, how many of you can finish your notes faster when you're doing a video visit? A few people, okay. That means all of you are super efficient and you have your chair here. So you say, I finished my notes in 10 minutes regardless, regardless. Um, and then um, the multidisciplinary care um, as well as specialty expertise. Imagine if you had someone who needed um, specific care in Marfans and there's one person who's here, but um, now you can see patients across the, uh, the state. But in addition, the technology is exploding. I was just at THT uh, conference in Boston where they talked about a lot of technology, which I'm not going into, but just for wearables, you have your accelerometer, the barometer, as well as uh, GPS and the biometric data, including um, ECG and, uh, you know, and, and looking at PPG. I'll give you an example. Um, and um, I guess since I don't know anything about the patient, uh, I was on my way back from Frankfurt uh, to San Francisco. We were three hours into the flight and someone had acute chest pain. They were probably having an acute coronary syndrome. And the question was, do we land in Iceland uh, or do we continue? And uh, this patient had diaphoresis. Um, had, uh, when I listened to this patient, they had uh, palpitations. Uh, their blood pressure was low. Their pulse was a little thready. And I said, okay, we're, we're in trouble. I think we're at the land. And I couldn't give uh, sublingual nitroglycerin because the blood pressure was about 90. So I gave, uh, gave fluid. Um, uh, we, I, of course, did all the other uh, basic stuff. And then I ended up act asking someone if they had a cardia. Um, and uh, there was one person on the plane who had one. So I actually got a six lead ECG, well, leads one through six. And I kind of felt like MacGyver because I said, I don't see ST depressions or ST elevation. So we know, we know we're not dealing with the STEMI. Let me manage this. And we actually stabilized the patient and uh, we landed safely in, uh, in California. So, so, you know, technology can go a long way. I was a little nervous. Uh, as I said, you can go past Greenland because, uh, <laughs> but I said, let's do it. Uh, it was my license on the, I had to give them my license number too. Um, and then, so other sources. So I think all of these are going to be really important and we can actually go to the cloud. And what I would emphasize is that for all of the technology that is existing, and there will be a lot that develops over the next five years. Uh, I think there are three key things. Number one is we shouldn't call it, um, you know, um, device monitoring. We should call it management with the device. So the most important thing is how you manage these patients. The second thing is we, if we're going to use artificial intelligence to guide us, we need to put safeguards around it so it doesn't scare the patient if it goes off a little bit. And then the third thing is I think we have to take it out of the uh, hand of the um, provider and put it in the hands of the patient. The example that I would use is imagine if everybody who has a smoke detector was hardwired to the fire, uh, the fire station. Every time the smoke detector comes off, it was the role of the fire, the fire person to come to the house and check to see if that was a false alarm. So we need to do the same thing with healthcare. And I think that can drive down healthcare costs and allow us to manage the patients over time. So as we continue to evolve, work that's being done by Dr. Hare, by Dr. Wu, a lot of work on the basic science and mechanisms, uh, gene editing, cell-based therapies are actually starting to cure disease. They have the risk of uh, the chances of curing disease, but we have to understand how to do this. And while we're waiting for that cure, we have to come up with better strategies for acute illness management as well. So it's a long road from the patient to the person. And often I tell the patient when I first meet them, my job is to get you back to being who you are uh, so that you're not, you're not your heart failure, you're not your disease. And as you transition to health and optimization, we have to remember whoops, uh, 
that the median family income is $56,000. For patients who, have, uh, who are not making that much money, the out-of-pocket cost for heart failure management is exorbitantly high. And we have to continue to drive that down any way we can. So in summary, preventing and treating heart failure in early sta earlier stages uh, improves overall outcomes. And it's gonna be really important for all of us to play a role in that. We need to address health inequities and actually that's gonna improve outcomes as well. And patient reported outcomes are important targets. And it's actually, it drives patients to be adherent to medications. And then remember that stability is often underestimated in clinical practice and leads to missed opportunities. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me for this lecture. Thank Dr. Lewis, that was an incredibly informative Grand Rounds. I don't think you left any stone unturned in the area of heart failure. That was great. Um, as people online are getting their questions together and people in the audience, maybe I can begin by, I agree that we need, obviously we, the earlier you treat the better. The challenge is how do we identify those even before they know they have symptoms and even before stage one, is there some sort of uh, genetic testing that we regularly do? Is there echoes required as part of now routine uh, looking? W what would you recommend? Absolutely. So I think um, the first is, I think a low hanging fruit is if you have a family, if you have a patient who has non ischemic cardiomyopathy, think genetic. And if you, if you haven't identified another reversible cause, such as hypothyroidism or alcoholism, et cetera, you should think this could be a genetic polymorphism. And, and, uh, and take a careful family history. And when you do that, make sure you ask about dying suddenly, not saying did you, uh, and uh, dying of a heart attack. Because a lot of times when people die suddenly, they're labeled as, oh, they died of a heart attack. They were 22 years old, they were playing basketball and they died of a heart attack. So, you know, you wanna ask specifically, has anyone died unexpectedly and at a young age? And if the answer is yes, do genetic testing. Uh, we need to get the cost of genetic testing down, down and genetic counseling needs to go down. And then the other is uh, really challenging, but should N-terminal ProBNP um, be a part of our routine blood test instead of, uh, instead of measuring, um, you know, as we measure your fasting lipid profile? Uh, I think the last thing that we can consider is um, utilizing this. You know, all of us walk around with a computer and there are over 5 billion people who have a smartphone in the world. So it does it, it goes across socioeconomic class. So if there's a way that we can use AI to identify patients who may be at risk, I think those, and then, but the key is the AI should tell you and say, you may have an actionable item, you know, go see your doctor for this. I think that's the, that's the future. Great. Yes, come here so I can give you the uh, microphone so the people online can hear your question. Sort of along that same line, is there an economic um, uh, stop to people because wearing wearables? Um, you know, because you're talking about wearables being the, the great equalizer. Right. Absolutely. So for wearables, uh, it's yes and no. I think uh, for that technology to actually take off, and there has to be kind of two things. One, it has to be cost effective, right? And so, and something, and there has to be value uh, for the person but it has to be something that uh, does not require an action, right? So, uh, so how many of you track your steps? <laughs> now show of hand, yeah, I have a smartwatch, right? So imagine if we can change the uh, technology so that this becomes your wearable. I think that's the key. You can't buy something separate. The problem is a lot of these companies don't wanna get into the healthcare business, right? Because of the risk of litigation. And so I think that's where tort reform has to come in. Thank you for a really exceptional lecture. I want to uh, echo what Roy said. I think you left no stone unturned. Um, I, I did want to ask you about one mechanistic pathway, um, uh, which you did allude to briefly, which is inflammation as, as a potentially modifiable risk factor. How can we modify, if we have a patient who doesn't have heart failure but has a, a high CRP, uh, they're already on a statin, what are other things that can be done in that setting? Right, exactly. And, you know, as you know, there are a, a couple of uh, pathways that have been evaluated, one of which both Paul Ricker have kind of uh, led the way in this. And uh, in general, I think you have to have target specific uh, 
uh, reduction in inflammation. CRP is a good marker, but I think uh, there are so many ways that uh, there are so many paths that drive inflammation that you have to really think about kind of the, um, the target uh, for, for reducing inflammation. Um, I think because of um, the uh, just generically reducing inflammation didn't work, you know, um, uh, it, it will set the field back a little bit. But, um, but I, I would say that if we were going to re redesign that study, I would look at patients with advanced stages. So class three, four heart failure with, uh, with persistent uh, inflammation and then target that because they're going to have a higher um, um, number of events. And I think you'll be able to have the power to show a risk reduction. I've always wondered if we ever, if we looked at TNF alpha uh, receptor blockers, uh, specifically in advanced heart failure patients who are in cardiogenic shock with inappropriate vasodilatation, that we probably will see a benefit. The problem is if I'm a company and that's a very small niche, you know, and so you may see a thousand patients a year that fall into that phenotype. So it's hard to get a pharma, uh, you know, kind of a, a drug company to basically sponsor that. But I think those are the areas where we really, in, in advanced critical cardiogenic shock patients, those are where we should look. So thank you. For 31 years, we've had this continuous lecture series. I thank the family of the Lembergs for being here today. And Dr. Hare has a presentation to our speaker.